Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. This is Firoz Manchi from Daraja Press. Uh, it is a, a real privilege for me uh, to introduce today's show. Um, you will probably be aware that Sylvia Tamale uh, has recently worked with us in publishing uh, decolonization and Afro-feminism. Uh, and it is, uh, in my view, an extraordinary, and uh, our, our people have described it as an erudite book, um, absolutely brilliantly dissecting the, and demolishing the dangerous tropes of coloniality uh, that distort our understanding of African societies, cultures, bodies, institutions, experiences, realities, and so on. Uh, an extraordinarily important book. I'm, I'm particularly proud to, uh, to, to have Sylvia Tamale uh, as one of our uh, authors, because years ago when I worked at uh, um, the press, we published African Sexualities, uh, which was also an extraordinary uh, um, groundbreaking uh, publication. So I'm really pleased today uh, to, to, to have Sylvia join us uh, to talk about this extraordinary book, Decolonization and Afrofeminism. We're very privileged also uh, to have uh, Charmaine Pereira, writer, feminist scholar from uh, uh, in, in Abuja, Nigeria. Um, who has agreed to, to engage in a conversation uh, with Sylvia. So uh, uh, welcome to both of you, Sylvia and to Charmaine. A real pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, so, the, the, the format today will be, I'll hand over to you, Charmaine, to engage in that conversation. And periodically I might intervene, but uh, I'll leave you both to have the show. Uh, so over, over to you. Um, thank you, Feroz, and um, thank you, Sylvia, for the honor of um, inviting me to be your conversation partner today for this virtual book launch. It's an immense, um, panoramic, thought-provoking book, and thank you so much for having written it. Um, it's also uh, tackling some of the key issues of our day at this particular moment in time um, and marks a, uh, a new foray, I think, in your intellectual life and journey. Can you tell us about that? How did you get started on this, um, this whole uh, project? Thank you very much, Feroz and Shermaine. Um, well, I'm 58 years old. <laughs> And in 2022, I'm set to retire from an academic career of more than 30 years. So I felt that it was my duty, my responsibility, to put down the knowledge that I had acquired over the years in a book. I was hoping um, that it will also serve as a learning text for transdisciplinary teaching. But I must tell you, Shabane, that. I, the book that you have, you have in your hands now is quite different from the one that I initially set out to write. The more I delved into researching and writing, the more I discovered that there was a lot that I didn't know, a lot. Yes, I've always tried to be critical of colonial discourses and capitalist patriarchal oppression, but I had no idea how powerful and all-encompassing coloniality was. I had not um, fully appreciated how pervasively coloniality seeps into every crevice, every crevice of our lives, and takes hold of our thinking processes and our ways of being. So if a professor like me does not fully understand the subtle workings of colonialism and coloniality, what about your Alessi, your Shegul, your Tokumbo, or Nomzamo? So um, we think we are educated when what we are really doing is 
perpetrating systems of power that are marginalizing. We have invisible puppeteers, you know, pulling the string from across the oceans in the, in the shadows of religion, education, law, language, globalization, and so on. So as educators, I, I think that we are directly implicated in students' outcomes, and I needed to redeem myself. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sylvia. Um, the cover is intriguing and beautiful. Um, can, uh, can you tell us about that and what it means for you? Oh, the cover. Oh, who else knows about the cover? You you have no idea how many hours I spent on the internet searching for a cover really? image that would convey decolonization and Afrofeminism in one fell swoop. I got a few candidates, but they were not very satisfactory. They were either too cliched or stereotypical or uninteresting. I even asked, I remember I even asked uh, my artist son to design something for me, which was good, um, but not quite 100%. Then one day I happened upon this image and immediately knew that this is it. So you can imagine the doubled joy when I discovered that the artist was an African woman, Joy Ogunpolo. She's Nigerian. We contacted her for permission to use her image and she graciously granted it without payment. I, there's something about scribble art that brings together so many elements in a simple yet powerful style. For me, the seemingly you know chaotic scribbles symbolize the mental confusion and physical pain that Africa is experiencing. And yet from you know what appears to be chaotic and messy, emerges a perfectly detailed, beautiful, expressive, and dynamic image of an African woman representing hope, representing new beginnings for our continent. Now the butterfly um, on the corner of Halip for me, symbolizes metamorphosis and uh, transformation. The butterfly, the, you know, the butterfly spirit, you know, of a new life. The woman embodies the agency of African women in spearheading transformation. I remember we requested to um, Joy, we requested the artist to redraw the image in high resolution for the book cover. And that process was quite hilarious because Joy kept sending me images that did not quite match her original. Either the nose had turned into a sharp muzungu one <laughs> or, or that authoritative haunting look that attracted me to the image had been lost. So I kept rejecting the new editions. Joy was extremely understanding and fully emphasized with the need um, to get it right. She was simply amazing. I love that woman. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, now, the title, Decolonization and Afrofeminism, I'm wondering why you chose Afrofeminism. It's in the singular. And as you know, there have been many debates amongst um, African uh, feminists about um, the terminology we use, how we refer to ourselves, what the African means, um, the extent to which uh, one falls into um, traps of you know, essentializing um, African women and, and what exactly the terms we use mean. So can you tell us a bit about what um, inspired you to use that particular term? Mm. Yeah, I, I, I'm aware that um, there are several variants of feminisms in Africa, of course, based on ideological and contextual differences. Um, I chose the term Afrofeminism 
um, as an all-encompassing strand of decolonial feminism. I, I, I think that it weaves together all feminist efforts on the continent that go beyond addressing the practical needs or the strategic interests of African women um, within the existing oppressive structures and also challenges the power structures embedded in um, social structures, knowledge production, global economy, and so on. Upper feminism is not limited to addressing oppressions based on gender alone, but analyzes the complex and um, dynamic ways that gender intersects with European hegemonic oppressions based on race, sexuality, um, disability, spirituality, and so on. So it strives for, Afrofeminism strives for um, radical transformation. Okay. Um, now, you also say that um, your book uh, is, is focusing primarily on British colonialism. As we know, there have been several um, European colonial powers on the continent, but your focus is on, on British colonialism. But even within that, um, there were different forms. So settler colonialism and um, indi indirect rule or a version of it, um, uh, native administration, in other words. So um, given that even within one country, um, whichever form of colonialism was used, you know, may differ. So for example, in Nigeria, native administration um, has different implications for, for people from different parts of, parts of the country. Um, how did you feel you would um, address those kinds of issues in the book? And was it um, uh, something you felt might be um, a challenge? Hmm. You know what, Shemaine, um, whether British imperialists adopted the form of settler colonialism or indirect rule on African soil, the ultimate purpose was the same. You know, um, that is the exploitation and appropriation of natural and human resources of the continent. So the adoption, the, the adoption of direct or indirect rule was based on issues um, such as climate or geographical accessibility, disease, and so on. But all, all, all were brutal, all were exploitative. So it is really um, substance over form, as they say in accounting. So this book um, does, does, doesn't really focus on the legal differences of the methods the British employed, you know, to govern the different territories that um, they were allocated in Berlin in 1984. They had convinced themselves and they had convinced the world that they were um, on a noble civilizing mission of that dark quote unquote continent. So the infrastructure form of colonial Kenya, Zimbabwe, and South Africa, where they practice settler colonialism, may have been different from that of Uganda, Nigeria, uh, Ghana, and so on, where they govern through indirect rule. But you know what? At the end of the day, <laughs> they feed on all of us the same way. They exploited, they denigrated, devalued our ways of knowing and our ways of being the same way. You know, they were reading from, you know, common colonial policies. Mm, right. Um, well, I can understand that, you know, in um, trying to uh, overcome um, the effects of colonization and particularly in thinking about coloniality, which has to do, as you pointed out, um, uh, with the implications of that for how we think, what we think matters, 
and what sources of knowledge we turn to um, uh, are very important. And these are critical issues. Now, you, um, you propose Ubuntu as an indigenous African philosophy and way of life which, um, which emphasizes humaneness and interconnectedness, and connection uh, not only among people, but also with nature, with um, uh, plants, um, animals, and, and the whole ecosystem, as it were. Now, one experiences that living in, in um, particular African communities and so on. And you refer to that um, when you talk about, you know, uh, life in, in rural um, societies that you've been part of and grown up with. Mm -hmm. How do you think Ubuntu um, or the uptake of this philosophy and approach can engage with power structures? Uh, and there are so many of them you know, in our societies and, and they differ. So um, there have been some feminist critiques that sometimes Ubuntu has been used as a way of um, putting pressure on women who've been violated in situations of conflict to forgive, you know, their violators. Um, and uh, this is, I think these are important issues to grapple with. So um, how do you think that um, Ubuntu can be used to, whether it's in our advocacy, in our scholarship, in our thinking, to undermine patriarchal privilege, um, global, uh, and, and privileges of different kinds, you know, because we are not just facing one. Yeah, um, instead of talking about patriarchal privilege, I prefer using the, intersec the intersectional term patriarchal capitalism because both systems lean on each other for support and survival. Um, you know, they're like Siamese twins. You know, one heart, you know, different limbs, but really, um, they support each other. So while the moral and ethical foundation of patriarchal capitalism is based on exploitation and denigration, especially of women, that of Ubuntu is primarily based on compassion and dignity. While the former system promotes individualism, the latter endorses collective action and emphasizes interdependence. So it is easy to see how Afrofeminism can invoke Ubuntu to undermine patriarchal capitalism. Ubuntu is, is a philosophy, it's a, it's, a, it's a philosophy, it is also a way of life that is well understood in most African traditions. The book joins many other African feminists that implore us to unwed our conceptual thinking um, from Western social ideals and trust our traditional epistemological, our, our, our traditional epistemology as legitimate, as authoritative. Now, thanks to coloniality, um, most of us have internalized the notion that anything African is unworthy. Ubuntu, I think, can be invoked in our theorizing um, about gender relations and for adopting principles of justice that can give more weight to the well being of groups such as women and other marginalized groups. So in the book, I urge African feminists to revitalize and to repurpose the values enshrined in Ubuntu. For example, hu humanness, humaneness, communitarianism, and egalitarianism. 
you know, uh, to you to to repurpose this in our struggles for gender justice. Ubuntu represents possibilities for um, and about our humanity as African people. I think we need to inculcate these principles into our children from when they are very small. You know, teach them that if you degrade or humiliate a human being, you're also degrading yourself as part of the greater whole. So in other words, you are because they are. I am because we are. But I, I, know I must emphasize that uh, patriarchal privilege cannot be fully, you know, what you mentioned earlier about um, you, some people misappropriating Ubuntu um, to, 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 you know, for it, for when it comes to issues of gender-based violence. Um, I, I must emphasize that patriarchal privilege cannot be fully undermined without addressing those inbuilt structural barriers that undermine women, including uh, gender-based violence, you know, neoliberal capitalism, resource redistribution, you know, um, the resource distribution system, education, law, religion, and so on. Those must be tackled um, in tandem. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, you refer to intersectionality as an important um, analytical um, framework for addressing both um, different and interlocking identities as well as structures. Um, and we, you know, we understand um, the sense in which people. Uh, are multiply positioned, you know, so you're never just a woman, you're never just a um, uh, a lecturer or, or just someone from, from a particular location in the world, but one inhabits these um, identities simultaneously. But you also use intersectionality to refer to, you know, various structures of oppression and these would include the law, economy, um, religion, and so on. So what do you think um, of uh, the implications of using the same word to, or the same framework to address both of these things? Because um, identities and structures uh, are, you are invoked or experienced um, in different ways at different times, and some um, one's identity doesn't always necessarily uh, in itself tell us about which structures are significant. So, for example, where there's, um, uh, you know, deprivation, malgovernance in, in a particular part of, of a country, um, what tends to happen is that ultimately you get uh, conditions of insurgency, conflict, violence, and so on being generated. And people will turn to particular ideologies that they feel are important for their own identity, like their religion. But if they take up religious religion, religious positionings to, ident to justify the violence, it doesn't mean that they necessarily understand the economic dimensions, the structures, um, that uh, may actually be more important, more significant in that particular context. Um, yeah, so these are big issues. Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, um, thinking intersectionally means that you're always aware of the multiple identities and experiences that people have, as you've said, uh, as well as um, the complex levels that power and privilege operate from. Um, I don't see any tension in encompassing both dimensions in the same construct. I believe that an intersectional understanding of both 
identities and structures simply lends clarity to what we need to do in dismantling the interlocking structures of oppression. Now, j just two weeks ago, Pastor Semenya, the South African athlete, who I write about in chapter four of, of the book, she lost her appeal for equal treatment in the Swiss Supreme Court. This was a clear example of the double standards employed by the IAAF, um, that International Association of Athlete, Athletics Federation. Um, they employed double standards on the advantages, quote unquote, enjoyed by Semenya on one hand, and for example, the swimmer, Michael Phelps on the other. Semenya's multiple identities as a gendered woman, socially and culturally, you know, she's a gendered woman, and on the other hand, a man, quote unquote, legally and biologically, can only be understood through an analysis of the multiple structural dimensions of culture, law, and science. As, as they were applied by the colonial body politic in, uh, in Switzerland. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, there's a lot. Uh, you have a chapter in the book on Simonia and Phelps. Um, and uh, actually, that just highlights the the range, um, the panoramic range of your vision and the and the book. Um, uh, at one point in the book, you have a critique of um, human rights, the universalism inherent in, in human rights, and um, the insufficiency of a focus on gender uh, equality as a way of, um, um, you know, addressing the challenges that women in so many parts of our continent face. And you propose an emphasis on different but equal complementarity as um, a way of addressing um, violations, inequalities, and so on. Can you tell us a bit more about that, please? Yes, um, I talk about different by equal complementarity. Uh, yes, I, I, I can see how invoking that argument can easily be misread as binary gender essentialism in this context. Um, as I argue elsewhere in the book, the notions of gendered men and gendered women are not only limiting, uh, but they are based on exaggerated portrayals of gender differences. So here, uh, I was trying to argue that we should embrace the complementarity, sorry, the complementary attributes that our heterogeneity as African people brings to the development and um, liberation projects of our continent you know, in, in the spirit of Ubuntu. Um, okay, but what does the complementary refer to here? I want to push you a bit more on that. The complementary attributes that, you know, um, that, that we as in, in our diversity as Africans, the different attributes that you bring in, the different, um, it is certainly not referring to uh, the, you know, biological roles, the biological attributes, but, you know, um, the, the diversity is really referring to, you know, the di in our diversity, we complement each other. And, and uh, you know, as we, we struggle for for liberation 
we bring different attributes and different values to the project. That's maybe it didn't come out very well, but yeah, that's what I was trying to say. Okay, um, you do um, also, uh, you know, prior to that argument, the argument that you make there, you critique the whole notion of universalism in human rights. So maybe it would help to give us, uh, if you could say a bit more about that. Why is that a problem? And how has it featured in so many, um, you know, arenas that we need to be aware of in um, thinking about decolonization and decoloniality? Um, can you say that again, please? Ask the, okay, uh, it, it's really asking you. Yeah, it's really asking you about your critique of universalism. If you can um, tell us a bit okay. and why that's important. Okay. Um, it's actually you. Um, when you talk about human rights and. Uh, the, the notion of gender equality. You know, th these are enshrined in international, regional, and national legal documents, you know, um, and they sound very logical and very attractive. You know, we've all advocated and struggled for gender equality and human rights for decades, you know. But, you know, a closer look at this concept using the lens of coloniality reveals the historical smudges, quote unquote, or, uh, that taint the concept of rights and the, concepts of e the concept of equality, which explains why um, despite, our, uh, despite our best efforts and our highest hopes, very little has changed for the majority of African women. So um, I, I really think that we need to get off the hamster wheel and address the real obstacles. Um, the term gender within the concept of gender equality takes off from the problematic premise of essentialized homogeneous women who are supposed to suffer oppression in the same way. And then equality within that paradigm of universalized human rights um, is also conceived as, as uh, sameness or equivalence. And in the book, I, I examine the history of treaty-based international human rights, you know, showing their core purpose and uh, their enforcement agenda. Their, their ideological orientation um, is largely based in, in Western liberal individualistic understanding you know, of rights, rather than in underscoring um, the critical vitality of group rights. And that is why I strongly believe that African feminists um, should adopt strategies that reflect an Afrocentric worldview like Ubuntu, which is more likely to engender um, real gender justice that affirms uh, social diversity. Okay. Um, you also write in different parts of the book about um, the uh, challenges um, of working uh, within an institution like the Academy that is supposed to be about knowledge building, expanding horizons, um, and so on. And yet in this practice, so often does not deliver. Um, and you also talk about um, gender and women's studies as um, uh, a vehicle or a way of trying to um, produce knowledge uh, that's informed um, from a feminist perspective. Do, to what extent do you think that actually happens in, in our um, contexts? And how have you navigated the difficulties of trying to do that um, within the uh, 
and hierarchies and and various constricting dimensions of a university. Oh, it is very tough. Um, you know, the, the, the African university, as we all know, is really a relic of colonialism. And um, it is, it, 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 it was, constructed by men, for men, and to date, you still see that power and the hierarchies and uh, the institutionalized masculinity within the institution of the academy. So it is extremely difficult, it's, it's, it's always, uh, a game of push and pull, you know, pulling, <laughs> pulling the rope for women, women to voice, you know, in, in you know the legitimacy of their work, especially feminist work within the academy. It is always taken as you know, you know, something that is not very serious, you know, something that. Um, you know, women's things. So we, all, we are always pushing, we're always pushing, and um, there are so many subtle institutionalized ways, micro politics that go on within the academy. So you 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 will you will not find um, the vice chancellor or, or although actually in, in some universities you will. But here you won't find the vice chancellor saying, you know, you can't, you, you know, women, women studies um, or, or gender issues uh, have no place. But it is, it is the the the, the subtle micro working of how the university operates. And in in Makere, in like it, you know, like the rest of the country, we have very many good policies. So we have a gender equality policy here. We have uh, the sexual harassment policy, and so on. You know, having is one story. Their enforcement and implementation is a totally different story. But also, um, when when it comes to the directorate, for example, we have a directorate of gender mainstreaming here at Makere. It is not supported. It has it, it, it financially. I think it's one of the bodies that is least supported. So you find that you know um, it is very difficult to 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 um, advocate for issues of gender in a masculinist institution like um, the academy we're always fighting we're always fighting and I, I, I think you know this like many other feminists in their in, in their in universities around the continent know this yeah um, it's um, precisely because that um, uh, institutional environment is so challenging um, that I think it it also um, highlights the sense in which um, the production of this book is is such a feat and something you know that's um, really important. You talk about the need for transdisciplinary um, uh, feminist knowledge. You know the the need to work across different. Um, boundaries of discipline, of ways of thinking, ways of being, and so on. And um, I think you mentioned, you alluded to that at the beginning when you said the more you, you the more you uncovered, the more you felt you needed to to learn more. Um, I think the uh, one thing that's striking about the book is its um, is its style. You know, apart from the beautiful cover, you have. Um, uh, you have um, the form, you know, where there's uh, poetry um, 
at, at different, uh, usually at the beginning and at the end of different chapters, but the, the thoughts and the, the feelings um, inherent in that po poetry um, feature in one way or another in the content. Um, now, how difficult was it for you to do that? But also, what do you, how do you think it might be um, best um, uh, approached as of, uh, in terms of pedagogy and content, you know, for um, uh, curricula in, in African universities, um, apart from, you know, thinking about issues of advocacy and so on? How do I think transdisciplinarity? Yeah. What's the question? Yes. Can you ask the question again, please? Okay. Now, you in the book, in the way, you've, in what you've covered, and how you've written the book, you've mm -hmm. shown what um, transdisciplinarity could look like. Yeah, because you've worked mm -hmm. across different disciplines and um, uh, have um, put forward particular positions based on that. Now, my question is. Um, how can one infuse that kind of approach in, uh, uh, infuse it better, as it were, or do more around that in terms of the content of gender and women's studies and um, in terms of uh, actually producing such knowledge? Mm. Um, uh, you know, it, 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 it may sound very difficult, but um, in the book I give the example of the Marcus Garvey Pan-African University, Pan-African spelled with a K, which was founded by Professor Wadad and Abdere in Eastern Uganda. And, uh, you know, he tried, he, he, he really tried to implement um, what he was preaching about transdisciplinarity. So in addition, in addition to you know having lecture halls on campus, they also have um, off-campus centers where students engage with local communities, and they also bring the local communities in the four walls of the lecture hall. And um, so you know they 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 learn using you know a different epistemologies, different methods, um, um, you know, pedagogical approaches. And uh, the, the problem is our mainstream regulatory bodies, like the National Council of Education, are, are still, you know, still thinking, it's still in that colonial framework. And they don't think that that is real education. So they have denied, for example, um, this Marcus Garvey Pan-African University uh, uh, practicing, um, they haven't commissioned it yet. But you know, it is possible, I think what we need, what we need really is awareness to understand that these siloed disciplines really what they give us is a frog's eye view of our problem, of the world. You know, if you're only studying in mathematics or law or geography, you, you, you fail to see how they interconnect and how they affect us as Africans. Um, so you really need, we, what we need is in the book, I argue that we need a hoax view to be up there soaring up in the sky and looking down. We, you know, having a very clear picture of what our challenges are and how they interconnect. That's why in, inter um, transdisciplinarity is very, very important. So um, we, we don't need to be aware of what transdisciplinarity disciplinarity is and um, 
to understand that you know these siloed disciplines really just engender um, coloniality and, and 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 move away from it. Okay. Um, I mean, thank you. I have I have a niece who did mathematics up to um, university, and you know she 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 was a very good student and she you know she would get A stars in all her papers, and everyone was fighting for her, you know, because with mathematics, apparently with mathematics you can solve any problem in the world. So, <laughs> you, so you can imagine a mathematician who is also endowed with uh, sociological knowledge and, and, and art and, you know, how, how much richer that person would be. But, you know, understanding, especially, you know, being able to peel away these, you know, the, the colonial blinders that, um, that, that stop us from seeing clearly what it is that we have to challenge, we have to get rid of in order to, to move on. You know, writing this book really gave me, it really gave me a 2020 um, vision of where we need to be. And, you know, I, I, as I said earlier, you know, I'm, I'm a professor and I'm supposed to know these things, but I didn't. So um, I, I think these siloed disciplines are one of the problems that we have. And um, we, we just need to understand, you know, that, you know, having a degree in law doesn't make you the greatest person in the world, actually, you're very ignorant. <laughs> yes, thank you for that, um, Sylvia. I think it also points to the um, the problems inherent in thinking that a single discipline can really solve all the problems in the world. We really get need to get away from that kind of um, approach. Um, finally, um, I want to put this uh, you know, um, raise the question of access to knowledge. It seems to me that one way in which we can try and overcome so many of the challenges um, that uh, we've discussed so far um, is, you know, widening access. And yet that is something that is uh, really difficult. And we do re um, write about that in the book. Um, but um, advocating for open access, which you have made possible with this book, um, in, in the sense that it's available to anyone who wants to read it um, as a PDF uh, and so on, um, really, you know, goes some way. And if there was more, of, can go some way to addressing the um, uh, restricted um, access to knowing what has already been produced out there with a view to producing more liberatory knowledge. Um, what uh, uh, are your thoughts um, on that um, before we move into a session where we can get comments and questions from the audience? Um, I really think that it is criminal to, com to commodify knowledge. Um, None of us, nobody can claim to be the original, you know, creator of, of knowledge, you know. There's no genius that exists on planet Earth that can claim original knowledge, you know. We all build on existing knowledge. We, the, we all know the old saying, uh, Jermaine, that if you copy one author, that's plagiarism. But if you copy several, that is research. Our, our conclusions are based on knowledge that we collect from others. You go out and interview people um, and so on and so forth. So it, it is criminal to claim knowledge as exclusively individual. 
and um, to, to profit from it. Yes, it is true that uh, publishers incur costs for publication, you know, typesetting, copy editing, indexing, and so on, distribution. But it's one thing to recoup such costs, and it's quite another to um, appropriate intellectual common or knowledge for profit um, enrichment. And this is mainly achieved through intellectual property, intellectual property laws or overpricing publication. Uh, these days, digital publication or free publications are not as expensive as paper publications. So for me, it was extremely important that uh, my book is available. It's available to the reading public for free. I, I think that uh, African governments, it's incumbent upon, upon them, you know, to, if they are serious about the uh, decolonization, the decolonization and decolonial project, that they must begin to fund um, scholarly publications would create important counter hegemonic um, decolonial knowledge. So if 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 the, if the funding comes from government, then you know there's no profits to be made. It's 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 availed to everyone because what we really need is awareness. We need to spread awareness about decoloniality as widely as possible, and uh, you know that was one of the four main objectives uh, for me writing this book. I, I, when I, when I, you know, that my main goal for writing the book was to symbolically open a door and force a confrontation with those comfort zones that we have been constructed around uh, various issues, which seem to have always been taken for granted. We take, we, we sit in our comfort zones and we take things for granted. So my main four messages were uh, Africa's transformation requires radical clarity and understanding of the deep legacies of colonialism, imperialism, and patriarchy. Um, secondly, that as Africans, we need to rethink and reconceptualize our feminist work by placing it in a decolonial framework um, that illuminates the relationship between gender, race, and uh, normative heterosexuality. Um, thirdly, I, I, I wanted to bring out to the fact that such understandings must be popularized and followed by not only popular but also followed by a reculturalization and rehumanization of all black people around the world wherever they are found and um, finally that all efforts to liberate our continent our beloved continent should be inclusive and pan-africanist in Nepal. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, we now move to Firoz, who has a number of questions um, or comments that people um, have put to uh, uh, you primarily. Um, so, Firoz, can you, if you can tell us? There's a number of uh, questions and comments uh, which I'll, I'll read out in a moment. But before I do so, I, I just wonder, uh, Charmaine, to ask mm. you, um, you've read this book, uh, you've interrogated and engaged in a conversation with, with Sylvia, but I'd love to hear from you. What are, you, what are your, so, let's say, three most important takeaways from this extraordinary book? Right. Um, you're limiting me by number, yeah? Um, it's a huge book, uh, 429 pages. Um, I think 
that the book is is really important because of its theme. Um, it's something that has been referred to in passing in in so many different contexts. You know, whether talking about uh, what independence actually means politically, economically, but on the other hand, um, decolonizing the mind, as uh, Gugi Wationgo has written. Um, and uh, beyond that, um, we haven't had a book written by an African feminist that tries to bring these uh, different dimensions of the issues together um, and that takes this particular theme as its focus. Um, and in doing so, I think what's also important is that Sylvia has shown how her activism in so many ways is critical to um, uh, the intellectual work that she does and that actually you can't um, separate them if you want to, to produce something that is truly transformatory. Um, of course, uh, it's difficult in practice to do that because writing takes a lot of time. And we know that for women to, to do that, uh, it's, um, it's really challenging because of you know, all the reproductive work that's assumed we do um, uh, and so on. And, and, and not everybody you know, has the same demands. And of course, when you don't have children, the, the challenges are fewer. But, um, to do to produce this kind of work uh, in terms of actually completing the writing over the period of one year is also a major feat and I think that in itself um, needs to be highlighted. It is possible, Sylvia has shown, um, for us to take some of the really challenging issues in our societies in terms of thinking for the future but also making links between the past and, and where our debt lies in so many different ways um, in order to uh, you know, um, come up with something that is, uh, is um, really quite magnificent. And I think that, um, I mean, you know, at, for any particular chapter, one can argue. One can argue about the particular positions taken um, and uh, uh, and that's important, it's necessary. I think we need to get away from a situation where we feel that feminists engaging in debate can only be seen as attacking one another. Of course, it matters how you do it. Um, and this is where it's important to recognize that the institutional culture that so many academics face is one of um, of confrontation, of competition, of trying to show that you are better than the other person. And I think what matters here is what Sylvia has done is, is to show that um, in the end, we diminish ourselves if we take that kind of approach. And what's more important, what's more significant is to draw on the cumulative knowledge that exists out there, it's not um, complete, no um, sense of knowledge ever is, but the question is what do you do with it? How do you use the knowledge? And how can we use the knowledge wherever it exists in a way that is more liberatory for the continent as a whole, for all the people who in it? And showing how feminists are really, um, and have been doing so for decades, um, doing uh, important critical work and i think the book is groundbreaking so that's why people should read it well i think i think that's that's uh, really important i mean I, I'm, I was very keen to hear your perspective on this and i and i think from my perspective i mean you know, one reads this book there so uh you, you may not necessarily agree with every proposition that is that is made but but i think where there's far too much obsession about the right answer rather than the right question and i think the remarkable thing about this book is that it provokes the right questions it is it is interrogative it is asking uh, 
for us to engage and and open up because if you don't have the right questions you will never have the right answers and, and i think this is really a remarkable uh, uh, achievement by by Sylvia. let me turn then to some of the questions that have been posed the first one uh, uh comes from uh sarah mukasa who writes um uh, i was uh, I was struck by your references in your book. The bibliography spoke of a vast wealth of knowledge and analysis from African scholars uh, who do not much uh, rec give much recognition, even in uh, African academia. How did this impact on your putting this book together? Sylvia? What, the bibliography? How did what impact? What's the this? The, the vast wealth of knowledge and analysis from African scholars, uh, which are not often given recognition by African. Oh, uh, okay, that was very, very deliberate. I, I mean, how can you be writing about decolonization and decoloniality and you don't um, make whatever effort you 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 you, you have to to find um, writings and arguments made by, and they're so, there's, there's, there's a richness of um, a corpus of knowledge out there by Africans. Um, so actually it, it was not as difficult as, as, as one may think. Um, you just have to very to, to just make a deliberate effort to foreground um, that kind of knowledge. It's 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 uh it's something that all scholars, all Africans, must do. Um, and it's not just any Af you know looking looking for African publications for the sake of you know because because. If an African who wrote this, then it must be um, decolonial in, in, in its conceptualization. No, it's, it is the same thing with uh, women. It doesn't mean that because some something is written or said by a woman that it, it, it is automatically translates in, you know, that it's feminist. So, uh, but there's a lot of literature out there all types of literature and that's that's why I, I, I usually had to use um, poetry because poetry says a lot in uh, a, a few stanzas and I, I just love it and the you know the, the melody and everything so yeah it wasn't very difficult but it was very very deliberate especially for this kind of book for this project thank you yeah, thank you. Um, we have another uh, question from uh, Francoise Girard. Uh, what avenues would you prioritize for collaboration between Northern feminists and African feminist academics to achieve decolonization? How can Northern academics be accomplices? First and foremost, they must be aware of their privilege and um, because uh, not all you know people from the north are aware of their privilege you may be you know, you may be uh poor underprivileged white person in the global north but you're still you, you still carry privilege because of your whiteness your whiteness gives you privilege so um, I, I think that just being aware of that privilege and actually stopping and listening and reading what we are saying and, um, you know, you know, without being, you know, bringing that uh, paternalistic or maternalistic attitude with them and you know, sitting down and conceptualizing, you know, strategizing together. Because really uh, fighting colonialism is not 
just an African project, or it's not just a global South project. I think um, imperialism and neoliberalism adversely affects so many people in the global north. God knows it does. And um, so this is, we're talking, decolonization is really a global project. It is a global, um, something that we all need to do together. You know, it, it, when 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 there was that um occupation what was it called occupy the project the occupy where you know yeah. that really i think uh, uh yeah it, it 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 shows that oppression global globalization doesn't affect uh, negatively, just the, the global south, but you know it's also a, an issue in the global north. So we really need to work together. But you know, as as Africa, Africa as a continent, we sit at the lowest rung in the international, you know, hierarchy. They, you know, if people like Trump call us the backwater, what did he call us? Shithole. You know that that really shows that we 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 have our own problems. That we have our own challenges that we must work, uh, you know, around as African, with allies, of course, from the global north. But so, to answer his question, uh, we need to sit down together at the table and strategize listen to each other and you know not talk down to you know to to some groups of people and work together okay um uh, we we have a um a, a comment uh really it's from uh let me just find from oshunoya um my PhD experience led me to a near existential crisis when I re realized my law degree wasn't everything. There was a lot more I need to know from political sciences, social sciences, and even anthropology. I'm much calmer now after reading as much as I can on these subjects. But, I, but really, I wish there was a way these elements were incorporated in my LLB and LLM uh, um, so, I mean, I think there's a question implicit in that. How, how, how can that happen? How can uh, um, these You see, that, that's really the criminality of colon, colonialism, what it did to us. Because what they do is they get, they get the cream de la cream of society, the best grades, and they go, you know, they put you in this silo, you go and do law. And um, most of the professors are just teaching the black letter of the law in a very ahistorical, very, you know, outside the context of, for example, the, the political economy within which the law works. And then, voila, you graduated LLB, you know, first class, when you are really empty. So I, I, I felt that I felt, I felt the same way as that, that um, individual when I finished my LLB and LLM because I did I did um, my first two degrees in law and I, I just knew that my PhD was going to be in another discipline to widen my horizons so I did my PhD in sociology and feminist studies and my goodness you know it's 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 just criminal we we have to get rid of these silos because you know you 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 think you've become an expert in your discipline but you really know nothing i mean before before writing this book i knew almost zero about post colonial studies and just reading the more i read the more excited i got so um 
I, I, when I was writing this book, I, I had the university student in mind. My, my, you know, I, I was writing for the university student, you know, that image of an African undergraduate university student was always behind my, my, my mind. And uh, of course, I hope that it interests many others, you know, beyond students. My intention was mainly to shed light on those ideological blind spots that block our vision and impede our full understanding of I so desperately wanted to spread awareness about the persistence of uh, what the post-colonial Peruvian thinker, Pujano, referred, referred to as the coloniality of power. You know, coloniality of power in all aspects of our lives as Africans. So I wanted to make a case for the need for us to unlearn dominant discourses on gender, on sexuality, on justice, citizenship, power, and so on. And I, you know, I, I, I really, I tried my best to be, to write in an accessible style. I really hope uh, that Charmaine, this came out. I, it was extremely important for my, for my intended readers to understand and engage with the text. That's why I included a brief definitional section at the beginning of the book, you know, to try and break down jargonistic boundaries and avoid, you know, you know, cluttered language. I really hope that I have succeeded at least with this, and I, I, I because I despise opaque, tortured writing styles. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I really tried to do in writing this book was the nine chapters are not written in a sequential fashion. Um, you can you can actually you, you know you don't have to follow one chapter. You read chapters in the order that uh, you know that they come to in order to comprehend the book each chapter can be read as a standalone material you know with minimum cross-referencing so uh, after reading in, in fact after reading the two introductory chapters you can jump to any other part of the book which picks your interest yes um let me come in here and yes and and um address the issue you raised um sylvia I think the book is um, uh, far more accessible than most scholarly texts. And I could see that from the, uh, the glossary, the, the term at the beginning, that you do make an effort um, you know, to, uh, to address those questions of, of a reader just not knowing what you're talking about. Um, I think there's always going to be a, um, an issue of uh, not quite um, uh, understanding um, what is written, particularly if you're talking about, um, you know, first year students or or somebody who is not um, uh, engaged with those issues before coming to the book. But this is where it's important to, excuse me, to emphasize the point you made earlier about the need to read. And, and you know, um, I think it also means that when you read, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't feel bad if you have to reread and if you have to go over what you think you've read in order to, to really understand it. But um, yeah, uh, to address another point that you, that was raised earlier, you know, how does one overcome the, <clears throat> The, the silos, the disciplinary boundaries. And you do th that in the book um, through um, taking particular issues, you know? So <clears throat> whether it's um, uh, juxtaposing Casta Semenya's experience with Michael Phelps or taking um, the, quest the issue of advocacy around human rights and gender equality, you know, these are things that um, uh, different readers will have engaged with in their own experience. So it's the fact of locating it in some kind of experience and uh, a happening, an incident or a set of incidents that people experience um, on, a, um, on different levels, on, you know, on day-to-day -day levels, but then that can 
just be unpacked and um, uh, analyzed in a bit more detail where you see that in order to make sense of what is there in front of us and which we may take for granted, um, you actually need to question the whole sense of what is taken for granted. Very well put, thanks. We we have quite a few questions. Are you are you time wise? Are you both okay with us continuing? I know it's late for you, but uh, are you okay with that? Well, a couple more. That's fine. Okay, there, 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 there are quite a few <laughs> which have come up. Uh, the next one, let me just say, it's, it's uh, uh, Louisa Essendi. Uh, she says, I would like to explore what opportunities are present for us as academic Africa towards decolonizing the language and mode of building knowledge, especially on matters of uh, sex, sexuality, and gender. And I think this is linked to also uh, a... Uh, comment from uh, somebody identified as APM uh, who, who asks, you know, what, okay, so this is available in the public domain, uh, but uh, what about, um, uh, you know, changing, what about publishing in other African languages uh, to support uh, consciousness raising and efforts uh, uh, um, in those uh, particular languages? Um, then we have uh, Josephine uh, uh, Ahikire um, says, decolonization seems unquestionably desirable, but more complex to work towards. Please expound on the notion of decolonization in this context. <laughs> Should we just take those three comments? <laughs> Josephine, you should read the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, she's been tricky. I think the, the issue of language is extremely important. And uh, um, it's very important for us to, to find a common language as Africans. Or at least in uh, you know you know regionally, you know, as a as a medium of of learning, as a medium of 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 our struggles. So um, I discuss some of this in 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 the chapter that discusses the academy, and I, I give examples. You know, T Tanzania with its Swahili has been as 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 official language has been very successful um, but you know there are languages like you know languages that africans have appropriated the colonial languages like english that have been nativized and subverted you know, like Pidgin English in West Africa. Actually, it is it is so widely spoken in West Africa that, that uh, the BBC introduced a radio service in that language. So we, 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 we can find common languages that, that, that uh, bring us, with, because, you know, the balkanization of our continent was, of course, one of the strategies that uh, the the colonialists, the imperialists used to separate us, to divide and rule, to make sure, you know, we we find it difficult. Of course, we, you know, even the colonial languages themselves are only spoken by the, the few educated ones. So language is an extremely important uh, cultural issue. And, uh, you know, as, as part of the decolonization project, we must find and there've been efforts i know that you know um there the, there's there've been efforts I, I i think it was uh jacob lapo in south africa he wrote a small booklet way back in 1945 Nguni and sotho you know where he was attempting to take on to take on this challenge you know um to, to find, you know, you find 
related dialects in a family of languages and you know it, it, it is done in china it is done in russia you know different dialects and you 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 find you, you get you know a family of, of language one language so that we can speak in our own language that is extremely important for for our decolonization project and decoloniality so yes it's a huge challenge but it is something that we must do it may it may be you know uh, um, long term but we must start on it our leaders our pan african leaders must start on this project it's extremely important um Feroz, what was the other question okay well there's there's a there's another one uh here um I'd like to ask if you can share your thoughts on how the movement of Black Lives Matter traveled to the African continent. More importantly, how do concepts like BLM, intersectionality, and so on and so forth, emerge in the US context travel to Africa, especially for African feminism? Might you want to tackle that? I think. Oh, they're what I took the same imperial. So, uh, when when they talk about Black Lives Matter in the U.S., Black Lives on the continent, it is relevant to the um, the diversity within those Black Lives. Uh, to also, um, you know, take cognition, that, you know, that the, the diversity of black lives, uh, lesbians, you know, disabled people, uh, they all at different levels. Oppression one, and it doesn't matter where we are. Imperialists, imperialists see us as the same, and they will continue pissing on us until we stand up as as that movement has done in the U.S. And of course, we are in solidarity with them and and uh, challenge their imperialist um, and and exploitative missions. Okay, well, there, there are several more questions. I don't know whether we have enough time for that. I see some guidance from uh, Shomei. How would you like to? Um, I Yes, I think that there will continue to be several more questions, several more issues, because um, precisely because of the nature of the book, you know, its scope, the interest that it has clearly generated uh but um we'll never be in a position to address all of them and i think at this point um we don't want to exhaust sylvia too much um but this might be the point to um for sylvia to say uh you know a few concluding comments um uh, before we thank everyone and bring the book launch to a halt um, sylvia Sure. Uh, Sylvia, some last words from you. Yes, first I, I would like to thank both of you, Firoz, my publisher, and Shabane for graciously accepting to be in conversation with me at this book launch. That it was really, really good. I, I loved it. And to thank everyone who took off time this evening or morning, wherever you are, to come and listen to us. Thank you very much. Um, I really hope that you will get the book and uh, read it, and we can continue in our conversation. Firoz, you can put my email. I'm, I'm fine with you putting my email on, on the stream so that people can continue you know, having conversations with me. I am very open to that. 
But I really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, Feroz, can you just um, uh, uh, let us know whether there's a link to this recording? Because uh, many people have, um, you know, wanted yes. to be able to watch the recording who were not able to take part it's, in it. It's, it's on uh, the uh, Facebook Daraja uh, uh, page. Uh, it's also on uh, on YouTube. And shortly, in the next half an hour, we will have it up on the Garajo website, both in the interview section and on the page uh, advertising uh, this extraordinary, uh, amazing book. I mean, it's just nice to say that, you know, uh, the original uh, proposition from Sylvia was for a, 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 a maximum 200-page book, like 170 pages. <laughs> uh, but as it as it grew and it grew richer and richer, I mean, it it it, it and we have to really acknowledge extraordinary thing to do in one year is to bring together this breadth and depth of vision in this book. And I, you know, I'm really immensely honoured to be. Uh, the publisher of your book, Sylvia. So I want to thank you very Feroz, much. you are very gracious. You are very understanding. I appreciate that. It was it was a labor of love. Let me put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> very funny. Yeah. I, I bounced yeah. from the yeah. with my candles. Sorry? Yes? I didn't catch what I you said, you know, sorry. I said I burnt a midnight lamp, whatever you yeah. Say and uh, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 the my family Good suffered as well, but it was, and at the end of the day, it was a day of life. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think that, that is that is clear. And um, I I should thank you, Sylvia and Firoz, um, for uh, you know organizing this launch. Of course, Sylvia for writing the the energy, the perseverance, uh, you, you didn't give up. Um, we need to learn more about how to keep on doing that. And um, thank you for the honor of inviting me to be your partner in conversation today. Well done. Charmaine, it's been great to have you uh, here. And I look forward to, to uh, your next book. Uh, and perhaps we will have a discussion here with Sylvia interrogating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but to everyone who uh, have part have participated, to to all the many who've asked questions, and I, we're really sorry that we can't take all the questions. Um, but perhaps I can summarize some of those uh, and uh, share them with with Sylvia, and perhaps on Facebook or YouTube, um, some responses can be given. But to all of you, thank you for, for making this such a successful event. Uh, and um, from Daraja Press, uh, here's to say, wherever you are, either sleep well, have a good day, uh, and thanks for being with us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.